Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's episode, we're going to talk about nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectroscopy. So we're going to start by looking at how NMR works. We're going to look at the different types of NMR that we might make use of. We're going to look at the internal standard we use called tetramethylsilane or TMS. We're going to look at a fundamental concept called shielding, which affects the signals that we get in uh, NMR. And then we're going to look at how to interpret an NMR spectrum, in particular three um, particular aspects called chemical shift, the splitting pattern, and the peak integral. So how does NMR work? Essentially, we're looking at the interaction between the nucleus of an atom and a magnetic field. Um, so NMR spectroscopy uses a basis of a magnetic field combined with radio frequency waves, or you know, radio wave energy, in order to actually understand the properties of a given nucleus. So one of the things that we can identify is that the nucleus has particular um, properties that will cause it to interact with a magnetic field. What we see is that normally, that if, if we look at this, this image here, that we see um, the nucleus has this property called nuclear spin. Um, that we're going to understand a little bit more about how that works in a, in a moment. But what it means is that when we subject a, a sample um, containing all of these nuclei to a magnetic field, that these nuclei will align with or, or will, that'll be caused to, be, to line up in relation to that field. Now, some of the nuclei will be aligned with the field, you know, like lining up um, a, you know, a magnet in this particular direction whereas other nuclei will be aligned against the field in a higher energy state. Now, normally, the majority of, um, of nuclei would prefer to be aligned with the magnetic field. It's a lower energy, more stable arrangement. What we see is that, that depending on exactly kind of how we subject these, this sample to this magnetic field, that then we kind of can get about half and half, provided that the strength is sufficient. So we get some, as, as we get an increasing field strength, we get this sum in this low energy spin state in line with the field and the other half against it. Okay, um, and so this, this low energy state is kind of where the majority would, would start and then those that are opposed it, will, we are, you can see that the spin is kind of going in this opposite direction in the actual image here. But then, so what happens is that we subject a sample to this magnetic field and it, the, these nuclei line up in a particular direction. Um, then what happens is that we can actually um, bombard that sample or subject those nuclei to energy from radio waves, which they are, are normally too low in energy to actually be interacting with any nucleus in a particular way. But in this sort of situation that we get this interaction taking place. So the nucleus absorbs this energy and what it does is it actually flips. So if we imagine like flipping the magnet from north-south to south-north, um, and so it actually then points in the opposite direction to the magnetic field. Um, but then what happens is because this is a higher energy unstable state is that um, after a, a period of time has passed that it actually will release um, this energy in order to go back to or flip back um, to its normal um, low energy state. And we can then detect the release of this energy and form a spectrum. So we can see that the nucleus absorbs this radio wave energy to go up and then it releases radio frequency energy to go back down. And the, the emission um, is what we are detecting. So we're actually looking for the radio waves that are given off by relaxing nuclei in a magnetic field. And this then generates an emission spectrum. Um, and the, the signals that we get in this spectrum are then what tells us about the, the nuclei or the kind of the structure of the molecule. So, not all, one of the things that we need to consider when we're looking at using NMR is that not all nuclei um, will actually respond to the magnetic field in this way. So we said that it, I said earlier that it needs, the nucleus needs to have nuclear spin, but even numbered nuclei do not have an overall nuclear spin. So that is if we've got an even number of protons plus neutrons together, um, especially if we've got an even number of protons. Um, that then we have this no overall um, nuclear spin. It's kind of it's the, the properties are balanced out, so it doesn't actually interact with or be a sub subjected to these changes in the magnetic field. So you can't actually detect these nuclei in NMR spectroscopy. Now, one of the th the reasons that this is important to be aware of is that carbon twelve, which is ninety eight point nine percent of all the carbon atoms that exist, doesn't respond to NMR. 
Okay, so that's going to affect what we can actually detect using this technique. Um, and then the isotope deuterium, which is hydrogen with a, a mass number of two, is also not detectable, um, which is, makes up a small percentage of um, hydrogen atoms or isotopes that you might come across. However, odd numbered nuclei, which have an odd number of protons or neutrons, so that we get this kind of imbalance, we get an overall nuclear spin, so it's going to respond to the magnetic field. This means it's detectable in the NMR. And so, for example, um, most normal kind of hydrogen atoms or, or protons, which is just has a mass number of one, carbon 13, fluorine 19, are all examples of things that are going to be detected. So carbon 12 may not be, but carbon 13 um, will be, which does give us useful information about the carbon structure of an organic compound. So the two main types of NMR that are, that are really the ones that we would be using in this situation are carbon-13 NMR and then proton NMR. So carbon-13 NMR is, is useful because we do get information about the carbon atoms in a structure, but carbon-13 only makes up around 1% of all carbon atoms that exist. So the chances of it actually being in the, you know, a large number of the atoms in our sample is um, is relatively low. So you get less structural information because it is difficult to detect this way. However, proton NMR, um, or where we're looking at these hydrogen atoms, is much easier to obtain because that's the 99% proportion of hydrogen atoms in the universe, and you get much more structural information about how it's put together. And we're going to look at how you interpret that information. Um, but, but one of the things to keep in mind is that both of these have their uses. You don't necessarily pick one over the other, that they both add information about the, the, the how the molecule is put together and they all form pieces of the puzzle that allow us to, to, to decipher um, exactly what's going on. Now, but one thing that we do need to consider is how, when we're actually measuring these signals, that, that part of what we're measuring is that we need to measure it relative to something. And we use this internal standard, this particular molecule called tetramethylsilane, or TMS for short, okay, because it's a lot less of a mouthful this way. TMS, um, which you can see the molecular structure here, is a, a highly useful internal standard because it has essentially no response in an NMR. Okay, it does have protons in its structure, which are, are capable to respond in NMR, except because of the symmetrical structure of this, that they actually, they all kind of cancel each other out. Um, you don't end up with any overall signal, or, or you kind of, or you get a relatively low um, response. And so what we say is, all right, well, everything else in, in we might analyze this way will have a stronger response to the magnetic field than TMS. So if we kind of set that as our benchmark, as our zero, um, as you can see over here, so this is this cor signal corresponds to the TMS, then everything else will be, in this case, further to the left of the image or, or have a stronger response to the magnetic field than that. So it allows us to kind of, kind of set the zero point of our scale and then we can measure everything else relative to that signal. So it's called an internal standard because we have it kind of combined within our sample to actually be able to test. Now, one of the properties that's going to influence the information we get in NMR is a property called shielding. And the shielding gives us very useful information to understand the structure of these molecules, but we need to kind of understand how it works. So, what we're saying is, all right, if we're trying to analyze or detect a signal from a particular proton, it's going to be influenced by the environment around it specifically the electron environment around it. Because what that's going to do is that's going to influence this property of nuclear spin, because that's actually kind of either going to decrease or increase the nuclear spin, depending on whether, um, you know, depending on um, whether we've got more electrons around that given proton or we've actually pulled them further away. So the, the magnetic field that that nucleus is going to experience is going to be, a, you know, is going to be changed as a result of these electrons around it. So it's effectively shielding the nucleus. The more electrons there are around it, the more nu the nucleus is shielded or protected from the magnetic field. So higher electron density is more shielding, and we're going to get a lower signal. And in, in NMR, lower means further to the right-hand side, closer to that TMS zero peak on the right-hand side. But what we can see is that the, also, the opposite is also true. That if we So we have extra electrons pushed around that nucleus. It's going to shield it. But if we actually move those electrons away from it, that we're going to um, get this concept called de-shielding. Um, that is that we have a lot less shielding, that we've, the nucleus is more exposed 
more going to get more uh, interaction with the magnetic field. We're going to get a higher signal that is further to the left hand side of the of a spectrum. So that means that then where the 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 where the actual kind of signals lie in the um, in the actual spectrum it relates to how shielded they are. Um, and that gives us information about the structure within the molecule because we kind of we can look at different functional groups and see how much shielding they provide to a given proton that we might be picking up. And so that leads us to the first of our three properties that we can interpret from an NMR spectrum, which we call the chemical shift. That is, how far away from the zero mark is the signal that we're looking at. So, and it's a shift, that's why we refer to it with a little delta. That is, how far different or how, how much stronger than the TMS signal is that particular signal that we're picking up. So this spectrum, I showed you the image earlier, just to show you the TMS, but this corresponds to the NMR spectrum for iodomethane, that you can see the structure here. So this is a proton NMR, so we're looking at the signal of these hydrogen atoms. Okay, we express this in terms of parts per million, don't really agonize over that, it just kind of relates to as a proportional um, difference. So further to the left is a greater chemical shift. Um, so you can see higher numbers that is less shielding. So this signal here in the red corresponds to something that is less shielded because the electronegative iodine atom is actually pulling electrons away from the nuclei of these hydrogens. Whereas the blue signal here, which is further away from that effect, is going to be um, that there's going to be slightly more shielding as a result of that. So we see a difference in the position of these peaks based on the environment that, um, that those protons are found in. And we're also going to look at the shape of the, the peaks um, in a moment. These two signals, um, the, the pattern that we're noticing at those places is quite different. And that pattern um, will, will be highly relevant to look at the environment here. But one of the things that, to keep in mind is that, that these chemical shifts that, that we might experience are quite predictable. That is based on the actual environment around a particular carbon or a particular um, hydrogen that we will get a different level of shifting. And so this is kind of an extract from our data sheet that we can use to actually say, all right, well, based on the structure and based on the sort of signals, which areas of which carbons are we actually pick, likely to be picking up? Are we picking up ones to do with amines or just regular kind of hydrocarbons? Are we looking at alcohols, um, ethers or esters or double bonds? Are we looking at esters and aldehydes or ketones, um, that depending on exactly kind of how that shielding is, is um, affected um, as a result of the environments around it, we get stronger or weaker shifts in a carbon-13 NMR. But we see the same thing um, in, in a proton NMR. So carbon-13 shifts are a bit more predictable, which is why we tend to use this as, as, as specific data um, to, to kind of go off there. Um, we can still use this information looking at proton NMR. Um, the shifts are a lot smaller by comparison um, because we're talking about smaller signals from smaller nuclei, but we do have a certain predictability that can be quite useful. But what you tend to, to identify is, is that we, we kind of look at the, the signals but based on the particular substance or as a whole, rather than saying, all right, well, it's definitely in this area, so it must be this. We kind of have to, have to look at the information um, in the puzzle as a, as a bigger piece. Okay, the proton shifts are much more dependent on their overall environment or what's nearby. They're much more vulnerable to these shielding effects. Um, so it's important to, to kind of treat it carefully. Um, but so one other piece of information that we're looking at here is the idea of the shape of the peaks. And so that is, you notice that, um, you know, so this, this signal that's, that's lined up in blue, that we have three peaks, uh, three kind of lines that correspond to the same part of the spectrum. Whereas the red one is listed in uh, shown in um, has four peaks, um, and so this is for the structure of chloroethane, and so you can see that they're color coded um, in order. We're going to pick up a different aspect of this image in a second, which is the the size of these peaks. But the the, the number of peaks that we have is actually a very predictable concept called the splitting. So the peaks, the the signal that we get at a particular spot splits based on the number of protons on adjacent carbons. So that is that these protons, their signal is actually directly affected by the protons around them that are attached to other carbons, not the same carbon. And so we, we have a, a predictable rule called the n plus 1 rule. That is, a given peak will split into one more 
than the number of protons on adjacent carbons. So you say, so we're looking at these blue ones here. On the adjacent carbon, there are two hydrogens, two protons here. So we end up with three peaks, two plus one. Um, the ones that are listed in red, they have three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. So we end up with four peaks and we get a certain kind of a splitting where um, that, that, we, that, that arises um, where we kind of have a stronger signal in the middle and then it kind of falls away on either side. Um, you can imagine kind of an imaginary in the middle here and then it decreases and you notice it more specifically with the blue ones. Okay, so the n plus 1 rule gives us information to say, all right, well, regardless of the shift itself, we can say, all right, well, this one must have be from a signal that has two protons next to it. This one must be from a signal that has three protons next to it. And so it allows us to actually identify. Be careful that you don't say, all right, well, therefore, um, you know, this has got three peaks, so it's the one that has three protons. This is the one that's got, um, you know, that, that, yeah, so it's kind of, we've got to think about the adjacent carbon. But the size of these peaks and their area is what we're going to look at now. Um, and so we see this splitting only in proton NMR. Important to, to identify that, that the carbon-13, you still get single kind of peaks. And so what we're looking at is our final point called the peak integral. That is the area under the curve at each of these, these points. Now, these spectrums are actually drawing them as, as very thin lines rather than they actually come up as peaks, like, like stalagmites. Okay, so the area under the curve at those points gives us the ratio of protons in that specific environment compared with the others. So that's what we're looking at here, saying that this signal, which gives off as a triplet or a, or a three-part um, peak, has a relative area of three, whereas this has a relative area of two. And that corresponds directly to the ratio of protons we're talking about. So we've got three protons here, so a ratio of three, two protons, two protons. Now just be careful because it, it's a ratio of, of um, protons in a particular environment. Um, that is, if you end up with identical environments, that those protons will be added together into the signal. Um, they, you know, we may end up, if you had, say we had another, um, this, this carbon was mirrored over on the other side, you'd have six protons contributing to the one signal, but attached to two different places. So you'd end up with a relative area of six, but not saying that there's six protons on the one carbon. So you do have to be careful to actually kind of consider, do I have identical um, proton environments or carbon environments contributing to this same signal that then I need to be able to actually kind of balance that out. So it does, this information does help us to deduce the molecular formula. It does help us to be able to, to say, all right, well, this one must correspond to one that has this many protons versus that number of protons and so on. All right, so I know it's been a long video. Thank you for your patience. But it's important that we go through some of these deep ideas. We went through how NMR works, some of the, the principles around the magnetic field and the radio wave energy that's involved to actually um, get information from a given nucleus. We looked at the fact that we use proton and carbon-13 NMR to give us useful information about molecular structure. We looked at the use of tetramethylsilane or TMS as our internal standard and that the, the signals we measure can be relative to that. We look at a concept called shielding, which affects um, where these signals actually lie in a given spectrum based on the electron density around them. And then looked at three aspects of how we interpret an NMR spectrum, looking at chemical shift, the splitting pattern, and the peak integral or area under the curve. All right, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.